Okay, so what I want to do in this video is generalize what we did in the previous video to two-dimensional systems. So in other words, I want to pick a plate, something like that, and try to find its center of mass. So try to find a point here such that if I let the plate go, it will be balanced on the center of mass. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at the idealized case where we have a bunch of point masses in a two-dimensional plane. We're going to calculate the position of the center of mass, and then we'll try to generalize that to the, 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 the more realistic system where you have a two-dimensional plate, continuous plate. Okay, so let's get started. So I'm working in two dimensions, say in the xy plane. Now suppose that I have a bunch of masses, m1, m2, and so on, with all the way to mn, and each of these, of course, has a position given by its coordinate x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, up to xn, yn. What I'm interested in here is trying to find the center of mass. So if I assume that all of these masses are connected by some sort of massless plate, I want to find a point where this plate will be in equilibrium. Okay, so how can I do that? Well, first, I can certainly calculate the total mass of the system. This is just as before. This will be given by the sum of the masses. So the sum from i equals 1 to n of the mi. That was easy. Now it's a little harder here to generalize the notion of the first moments. So remember that the first moment in the mass in one dimension was given by the mass times its distance, right, its position. Now how can we define that in two dimensions? Well, we have to generalize it in two different ways. So I'm going to call first the first moment of the masses about the y-axis. So this will be given by, so I call it capital MY, this will be given by the sum of the masses times their distance from the y-axis. So if my y-axis is here, I want to calculate the distance like this, which are of course given by the x-coordinates of the masses. So this will be given by the sum from i equals 1 to n of the masses times their distance from the y-axis, which is the x-coordinate. It's important you don't make the mistakes. The mistake here, there's a y because it's the first moment about the y-axis, but the x is entered here because we're talking about the distance from the y-axis, which is given by the x-coordinates. All right, and then you can do the exact same thing with respect to the x-axis. So the first moment about the x-axis is going to be given in the same way as the sum from i equals 1 to n of the masses times their distance to the y-axis, which is just their, to the x-axis, which is given by the y coordinates. All right, so with this generalization now we can find what the position of the center of mass is. It turns out that it's given by a very, very similar expression than what we had in one dimension. Now of course the center of mass has two coordinates, x-bar and y-bar, and the x-coordinate here is given by, if you think about it, if you're talking about the x-coordinate of the center of mass, you should think of uh, the, the first moment about the y-axis, Right, which was kind of calculating how the center of mass in the x direction was. So this will be capital M of y over the total mass. And in the y direction, then you're looking at the first moment about the x-axis. So you get capital M of x over n. And this is how you calculate the center of mass of a bunch of point masses in a two-dimensional plane. Okay, so what we want to do now is generalize this situation to the case where you have a continuous distribution of mass in two dimensions. For example, this phone, which is a lot more realistic. So how can we find the center of mass of this phone? Well, it turns out that it's actually not so simple. So we'll restrict ourselves uh, to a simpler case. So we're going to assume that the mass density, so in this case it's aerial density because it's, it's a surface, so that the aerial density sigma here, I'm going to call it sigma, is constant. So I'm not going to let the density vary. I assume that my phone has the exact same density all over its surface. Okay, so how can we calculate that? So I'm going to set up the problem first. So let's define what my uh, plate will look like. So I'm going to take it to be given by the area bounded by first two functions, y equals f of x and y 
equals g of x, assuming here that f of x is greater or equal than g of x. And I'm also going to take two lines, vertical lines x equals a and x equals b. And I'm taking my plate, my two-dimensional object, to be given by the area bounded by these curves. Okay, and what I want to do now is calculate the center of mass of this area, assuming that the mass density is constant. How can I do that? Well, it's not so obvious. So what I'll do is, as always, is the same strategy. I'm going to slice the problem into manageable slices, and then try to calculate uh, the quantities of interest for each of these slices, and then integrate to get the whole thing. Now, the proper or one way of doing it here is to slice it into little vertical rectangles. Right, so these are little rectangles of height given by the difference between the functions, so f of x minus g of x, and width that I'm going to call dx. Now what I'll do is calculate for this rectangle what its mass is, what its moments about the y and the x-axis are, and then I'll sum over all rectangles to get the total quantities and find the position of the center of mass. Okay, so let's start by calculating the mass. So this is for my typical slice. So the mass I'm going to call the m. So the mass here is just given by the density, which is constant, times the area of the slice. So this is just f of x minus g of x times dx. And then I need to calculate the first moments about the y and the x-axis. So the trick here to calculate the first moments is the following. So the trick will be to replace the rectangle here, the kind of uh, little uh, rectangle here, by a point mass centered or situated at the center of mass in the vertical direction of this little rectangle. Now this is a trick. I can do it because everything is constant, the aerial density is constant, so in general I could not do that, but here it's going to work. And also you have to be careful to study, uh, say, second moments or moments of inertia of the system, which we will not do here. But if you did that, you would not be able to do that, so you have to be quite careful. But here it works. So we can do this trick. So we're going to replace the whole thing here by a point mass centered at the center of mass. So the x coordinate is just x, the coordinate of the rectangle. And we also know what the center of mass is here because I'm assuming that the density is constant. So the center of mass in the vertical direction is going to be just at the middle point. So the x coordinate here will be 1 half times f of x plus g of x. Sorry, minus g of x. No, plus g of x. I'm right. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, so if I replace now this rectangle by a point mass at the, earth, at the center of mass, I can certainly calculate the moments of inertia of this point mass. So uh, the first moment, not the moments of inertia, but the first moment, so the first moment about the y-axis will be given by the mass of this point mass times the distance to the y-axis, which is its x-coordinate. So it's going to be given by the mass, sigma times f of x minus g of x times x dx. x here comes from the position or the distance from the y-axis. And the first moment about the x-axis will be given again by the mass, but now the distance from the x-axis. So I get sigma times f of x minus g of x times the position here, one-half f of x plus g of x dx. And these give me the first moments and the mass of my rectangle. Okay, and then the next step, as always, is to sum over all slices, which means in this case to integrate from x equals a to x equals b to define the total mass and total moments of the system. So the total mass here will be given by the integral from a to b of dm. Sigma is a constant, so I can take it out, and I'll end up with this formula here for the total mass. Now the first moment about the y-axis will also be given by the integral from x to a of this. Again, I take the sigma out, get this, f of x minus g of x times x dx. And the first moment about the x-axis is given by the integral of this equation here. can take the sigma out, I get the integral from a to b. Here I can simplify a little bit, so I have one half this times this gives me a difference of squares. 
f square of x minus g square of x times dx. All right, and then with this, I can define the center of mass of my plate, just as before, just as for a bunch of point masses. So the position of the center of mass will be given by, the x position is given by the moment about the y-axis divided by the total mass, and the y position by the moment about the x-axis divided by the total mass. And if I substitute here the formula, well, first you see that the sigmas always cancel. This is because sigma is assumed to be constant that they cancel. If it wasn't constant, it would not. But because it does, because it is constant, it cancels. So the first expression here will be integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x dx over the integral of a to b of f of x. Sorry, there was an x up here as well. x dx, then I get minus g of x dx. And for the y coordinate of the center of mass, I get one half integral from a to b of f square, f square of x minus g square of x dx over this total mass here, but divided by sigma, so I get integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x dx. All right, and this is the final formula for the center of mass of a two-dimensional plate with constant aerial density. Now, one thing you could notice as well is that the denominator here really is just the area of the plate, which is the same thing here. So denominators are just the area. Okay, so that's the general formula. So we'll work through some examples in class of how you can apply that in some concrete situations.